Hello everyone, uh, welcome to another one of my videos and uh, today I'm going to be uh, doing a little something special in this particular video. I, since you all know I'm a game, a game designer by profession and I'm also a, a very passionate gamer at heart as well and I'm also a passionate historian of video games and uh, I've been doing my, uh, my fair share of research over the years on video games and how they're made and the different people that contributed to this. Uh, to this industry and how the how the games have evolved over year, over the years and everything so uh, I thought I would just put all of that uh, all of those uh, all of that research of mine into one video and so I decided that I would make a list of my all-time favorite video game designers so yeah uh, before we move on I set my uh, I set myself a criteria of how I would go about picking people for the list and uh, it goes something like this i will be excluding people that have contributed to the hardware side of the industry and i will be only looking at people that have contributed to the software side of the industry so yeah and i will also be omitting uh, certain uh, more prominent more obvious personalities out there such as shigeru miyamoto of nintendo gunpei yokoi who created the, uh, created the first game boy hideo kojima everybody knows about hideo kojima he's a very famous personality in the games industry plus um, I have my philosophical differences with the guy, but I'll leave that for another video. And uh, Ralph Baer and Gabe Newell, Lord Gaben, I'm going to be leaving out. So sorry, all you Gaben fans out there. Todd Howard of the Fallout and uh, Skyrim uh, and the Elder Scrolls series, I will be leaving out. Toby Gard and uh, also Satoru Iwata, I will be excluding from the list. So yeah, let's move on with the first one. And the first one, uh, so uh, basically this is my top 51 favorite video game designers of all time. So let's move on with the first one on the list, and we have Ken Levine, who's an American game designer. And most most of you people out there uh, know him for his more more recent works. But I will be looking, uh, I will be digging a little uh, a little bit into the history of each game designer and how how they started off in the industry and all that stuff and their and their uh, major works and everything. So I've got their I've got their profile down in bullets, and we're gonna go through them one by one. So starting off with Ken Levine, who's an American game designer. He started in Looking Glass Studios. He was the writer and world builder on uh, Thief the Dark Project. And he founded Ir Irrational Games later on. And he served as lead designer and writer on the highly acclaimed System Shock 2. So his uh, notable works are the Bioshock series and the Freedom Force series. Moving on, we've got Ron Gilbert, who's also an American designer. And he worked at LucasArts. And he was the creator of the Scum Engine, which is responsible for uh, many adventure classics out there, such as Maniac Mansion, Monkey Island 1 and 2. After LucasArts, he worked with Telltale. On, uh, he worked with Telltale Games on Tales of Monkey Island, which was a reboot to the Monkey Island series, and Death Bank. He also created Death Bank, and he also worked on. He also created The Cave, which was a very good 2.5D puzzler adventure game, at Tim Schafer's Double Fine Studios. And uh, his most recent game is Thimbleweed, uh, which was done through crowdfunding. Next up, we have Tim Schafer. Of course, uh, we we can't skip Tim Schafer without. Uh, without mentioning, uh, we can't talk about Ron Gilbert without mentioning uh, Tim Schafer because uh, they were very, they worked very closely together, especially in the early years when uh, adventure games were at an all-time high. So Tim Schafer is an American video game designer who is a was a longtime LucasArts employee, and he worked on classics such as Full Throttle, Day of the Tentacle, Grim Fandango, and assisted design on Monkey Island One and Two with with Ron Gilbert. He is the founder of Double Pine Productions, responsible for acclaimed titles such as Psychonauts and Brutal Legend. Next up, we have Jordan Mechner, who's also uh, who's also an American, and he's the creator of the Prince of Persia series. He single-handedly created the first Prince of Persia game, which uh, basically he and he pioneered realistic uh, rotoscoping animation, spawned an entire genre in video games called cinematic platformers, which were basically very realistic side-scrolling games in which gravity applied you would die from a uh, from, from a fatal height and all that stuff and the animations were very realistic and he he single-handedly spawned a whole genre which is now known as cinematic platformers and uh, it's seen it's seen a decline lately but i think it's making a comeback like all other uh, uh, all other genres out there that that saw a hiatus for a while such as in adventure games are also making a comeback so yeah also led the creation of the last express which was an underrated game, a very underrated adventure game, and, and, it, and it worked in real time, and it, it, it had this gimmick about, uh, about the story moving forwards in real time or something. So yeah, next up we have Hal Barwood, my personal favorite. He's an American. He's, he, not, he's not so much a game designer as he is a writer. So he worked on, he, he's basically a screenwriter for Hollywood. He, he's done a lot of stuff in Hollywood. So he worked with George Lucas uh, on his, 
sci-fi movie called THX 1138. If you guys haven't seen that, I would recommend it. And uh, he worked on many screenplays for movies such as Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He worked at LucasArts to create the acclaimed Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis and Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine. Both of my, both games are my all-time favorites. They're up there for one of the best games I've ever played, especially Fate of Atlantis was this adventure game and that had like crisscrossing paths you could take and you could change you could you, you could go in any any direction in that adventure game usually adventure games would be very linear but this was probably the first time they had multiple endings and multiple pathways and multiple ways to play the game an adventure game at that so yeah he has uh, he was a major influence on the indiana jones games franchise so let's move on american mcgee He's also an American game designer, met John Carmack and John uh, and joined IT Software where he worked as level designer among other designations. With IT, with ID, he worked on games such as Doom 2, Quake, and Quake 2. Eventually got fired from IT and joined EA to create the cult classic American McGee's Alice. It's an excellent game, you should play that. Other notable titles are American McGee's Grimm and uh, Alice, the American McGee's Alice saw a sequel not too long ago called Alice Madness Returns. It wasn't made by American McGee, it was a, I think it was some other, American McGee didn't have anything to do with it, it was a sequel that they, they made for his original game. And next up we have Hubert Chard, Chardot, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name because he's French, so I, 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 I assume it's something around the lines, uh, along the lines of Hubert Chardot, with, as, that's as French as I can get with pronouncing his name. So yeah, basically he's best known as the writer of the original Alone in the Dark series. If you guys aren't familiar with that series, well, no. That before Resident Evil, there was another uh, game series that basically kicked off the, uh, basically established the survival horror genre, especially the tank controls, pre-rendered backdrop thing, ch cameras changing every time you exit out of a frame or something. So Alone in the Dark series was the first one to do that, and Hubert Chateau was the was the writer on it, and uh, yeah, so he was best known as the writer of the original Alone in the Dark series that spawned the survival horror genre. Although Resident Evil would later copy and popularize the style of gameplay. And he worked on many other games in different roles, such as writer and director, uh, especially on the cult classic called The Devil Inside, which is a very unique game because it was a re reality TV based horror action adventure game. I'm not going to give away too much, you can go look it up yourselves. And next up, we have Ed Anunziata, who's also an American, and uh, he's best known as the creator of the Echo the Dolphin series on the Sega Genesis and Mega Drive. My love for dolphins comes from my experience with the Echo the Dolphin games. So, and he worked on many early titles during his time with Sega, such as Spider-Man, Jurassic Park, Vector-Man, The Adventures of Batman and Robin, and many others. He served as producer on uh, Nokia's uh, N-Gage phones and created many titles for it, even though like, the N-Gage was a failure, but it, it was still a step forward for mobile gaming. Next up, we have Yu Suzuki. Who's a Japanese? A lot of you people already know about him. He is the creator of many of Sega's arcade hits, such as Space Harrier and Afterburner. He pioneered many 3D polygonal polygonal games, such as Virtua Fighter, which was the first 3D fighting game preceding the more popular Tekken franchise, and the Virtua Cop series. So he was the pioneer of 3D graphics in video games. That's how important this guy is to the history of video games. So he paved way for sandbox games with his highly acclaimed Shenmue series on the Dreamcast. So most of you think out there that GDA was the one that started the whole 3D sandbox thing, but it was basically Yu Suzuki that brought the idea forward in a 3D uh, in a 3D environment. So it was it wasn't it wasn't open world, but it was open district. But it was a start to open world games. And he also introduced motion capture technology in video games that is so prevalent today uh, through his Virtual Fighter titles. Kickstarted and fully funded his Shenmue 3 project recently, which has yet to be released. Next up, we have Nasir Jabeli. He's an Iranian American game designer. He created many early Apple II titles that were ahead of their time, including 3D shooters. Went to Nintendo in Japan and became responsible for the creation of the first three. Uh, the first three Final Fantasy games on the Nintendo Entertainment Systems and established many unique systems such as character creation and character classics. So he's the guy responsible for basically the, the, the technical side, all the technical achievements that Final Fantasy had at the beginning. And he is a major inspiration to game designers out there such as John Romero among many, among many others. Afterwards, Jibeli retired from video games. So we haven't heard from, we haven't, we haven't heard from him since. 
Next up, we have Randy Smith, an American video game designer. He worked extensively on the Thief series at Looking Glass Studios and Ion Storm. He frequently lectures on game design at GDC. He created this celebrated level from Thief Deadly Shadows called Robbing the Cradle, which is considered to be the most atmospheric and scariest level of all time. And I'm not kidding there when I say it's the most atmospheric level of all time out there. If you, if you, if you, you know what, just, just go ahead and play Thief for, just for the sake of checking this one level out, which is called the Cradle, because this level is so great that there is a whole there's a wikipedia article on the level and the 12th page article in pc gamer was published just on this level alone i mean there's only i think there's only three or four uh articles on wikipedia that that have to do with uh, a single level in any in, in a video game and uh, robin the cradle is one of them i think the, the one the, there's one level on super mario brothers and then there's one level on sonic the hedgehog and then you have robin the cradle and i don't know what the fourth one is i if, if there is a fourth one at all but it's it's that awesome that level that it, that it that it warrants its own wikipedia article next up we have al Lo, who's an american and he's uh, if you guys are big on classic adventure games you would know who this guy is already he is he's uh, worked on many sierra online adventure games such as king's quest and police quest but he's best known as the creator of the leisure suit larry series yes if you guys don't know who leisure suit larry is you should you you should go back in time and play those games because those games are fucking awesome and they had some of the best humor i've ever 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 experienced in my life so and he's also a professional saxophone player and he plays with many bands every now and then has since retired from the gaming industry but still runs a website known as al Lowe's humor site so yeah he's still up there on the interweb, interweb somewhere uh, next up, we have Rob Roberta Williams. Uh, she's American, and she co-founded Sierra Online along with her husband, Ken Williams. And uh, she's known for her pioneering works in adventure games, responsible for many classic titles such as the King's Quest series and Phantasmagoria. She, you guys should check out all those game, all these games that I'm mentioning in this video because you you won't want to miss out on these. These are these are like you can call them like landmarks in video game history. So yeah. And next we have Ken Williams, uh, who is uh, the husband of uh, Roberta Williams, and uh, he co-founded Sierra Online uh, along with his wife, Roberta Williams, served as CEO at Sierra Online. During the decline of adventure games, Sierra Online focused on publishing games such as the highly acclaimed Half-Lives. That's right, the, the original, the first original Half-Life was published by Sierra Games. Had the chance to buy off id Software, can you believe that? He had the chance to buy off id Software, but he chose to pass, and he would slightly regret that later on. Made cameo appearances in many ga made cameo appearances in many games such as the Leisure Suit Larry and the Space Quest Space Quest series. Ken and Roberta Williams have since retired. Next up, we have Jane Jensen. Oh God, how I love this woman! Seriously, she is best known as the creator of the highly acclaimed Gabriel Knight series. Uh, if any one of you out there has ever played a Gabriel Knight game, you would know this shit is real. This is this, um, excuse my language, but that. This is huge. I mean, Jane Jensen was huge when it came to writing good video games. So, well, she's married to musician Robert Holmes, who contributed to the memor uh, 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 who contributed the memorable soundtrack to the Gabriel Knight series. So yeah, that soundtrack you can never get out of your head. Those masterpieces. It was all her, uh, her husband that did it. So yeah, she joined Sierra Online and worked on many classics such as the King's Quest and Police Quest series led her first game in the form of Gabriel Knight, Sins of the Fathers, which was a dark and supernatural thriller that, so, that showcased Jensen's writing excellence. Founded Pinker, Pinkerton, Pinkerton Road and created the adventure game Mobius Empire Rising, although her games received uh, somewhat of a lukewarm uh, reception. After somewhat retiring from video games, Jensen writes gay romantic novels under the pen name Eli Easton. <laughs> so, Moving on, John Carmack, American video game designer, co-founder of id Software, worked on classics such as Commander Keen series and Wolfenstein 3D. Most of you already know about John Carmack and his technical achievements in video games. And he's known for popularizing many innovative techniques such as ray casting and 3D shooters. Became interested in rocketry and started Armadillo Aerospace, an advocate of open, so open source software. You don't find many of those out there. Changed the face of the industry with titles such as Doom and Quake. Next up, we have Adrian Carmack, and he's not related to John Carmack in any way. Uh, and he was one of the founding members of it Software. So the, I think there were four founding members of it Software. Uh, John Carmack, Adrian Carmack, no relation to each other, uh, Tom Hall, and John Romero. Uh, so yeah, moving on. He worked as an artist on several it titles, and... 
Hey, sorry for interrupting my own video, but there's just one more thing I'd like to add about Adrian, Adrian Carmack. He came up with the term jib. Uh, you 90s gamers probably know what jibs, uh, jibbing is. Basically, uh, jib, a jib is basically the effect in a game where when you kill an opponent and he plays his death animation and he falls flat on the floor, and if you hit him again with a rocket launcher or some other uh, super-powered weapon like that, that uh, the corpse of that person explodes into tiny bits and pieces of flesh and guts, uh, kind of like giblets, which is where the term comes from. And uh, yeah, this term was coined by Adrian Carmack. And uh, yeah, so whenever they say, oh, this game has got great jibs, it basically means this game has got that great effect of people blowing into bits and pieces of flesh. So yeah, that's one thing. Now back to the video. So yeah, you don't see many of those in video games today because video games today like to use ragdoll effects a lot and ragdolls don't really explode as well as all those other 90s titles you had. For example, in Half-Life, you've got a corpse, you hit it with a crowbar and it just explodes into like tiny bits and pieces of flesh. So yeah, moving on, uh, he recently reunited with John Romero to work on another game that we have yet to see. Next up, we have the infamous John Romero, American video game designer, one of the founding members of its software, single-handedly developed the first dangerous date game. I remember playing this game in school in our computer lab, and I was just blown away at the fact that it was just one person that made this whole game back then, Dangerous Date 1. So yeah, he worked on many classic titles such as Wolfenstein 3D, Hexen, Doom, and Quake. Known to have coined the term Deathmatch. Okay, uh, let me just correct myself here. I'm not too sure if he worked on Hexen, but he did work on the other games. So yeah, he is he is known to have coined the term deathmatch. So this term that is that has become part of your everyday gamer lingo is was coined by John Romero. He's the one who started calling these these free for all matches deathmatch when he used to play uh, you know LAN games with his friends like Doom and stuff like that back in the day. And uh, yeah, so moving on. His major inspiration and favorite programmer is the one we discussed earlier, Nasir Jabeli, the Iranian-American game designer that most people don't know about. It uh, don't know about. He was his major inspiration and his favorite video game designer of all time. Differences with John Carmack led John Romero to start his own company known as Ion Storm. Ion Storm was a very good company. They came up with some great titles, but they were a little too pretentious for their own good, which is why they went down early in their in their in their in their career. In their lifespan. So yeah, Ion Storm created sequels such as Deus Ex Invisible War and Thief Deadly Shadows. Hyped, ad hyped, ad hyped, ad hyped advertising and the haphazard production of his game called Daikatana notoriously failed and is considered as gaming's greatest blunder. Uh, you probably know about Daikatana or you probably don't. If you know about Daikatana you would know how miserable, uh, how miserably it failed because of all the, all the hyped uh, uh, advertising that, the, that they did for the game. For example, there was this, uh, there was this uh, one ad in a video game magazine that I saw it was just all red and in black text it was written, John Romero is about to make you his bitch. Nothing else. So that was the kind of ad campaign they were running for the game pre-release. And uh, yeah, it was a very haphazard production and things went up and down and in the end the game came out unpolished, very shoddy and uh, just didn't do well. And it became the gaming, gaming. Uh, it became one of the greatest blunders in video game history. But it does not change the fact that Romero is still a key player in the video games industry, even to this day. And next up, we have Peter Molyneux, who is an English game designer, also one of my all-time favorites. By the way, this this list is not in any particular order, so don't feel like I'm going from the worst to best. Or, or something like that. It's, it's in no particular order. It's very randomized, so don't worry about the order much. So Peter Molyneux, he's an English game designer known to many as the creator of the god game genre, such as uh, with titles such as Populous, Dungeon Keeper, and Black and White. He co-founded Bullfrog Productions, which was responsible for Dungeon Keeper, Dungeon Keeper 2. Later on, he founded Lionhead Studios, which made the Black and White games. And he's notorious for making huge promises prior to release that become too difficult to fulfill. So yeah, he's, he's just, I, I don't think he's got anything sinister in the back of his head, it's just that he's just, he gets overexcited about his games and then he, he starts making these huge claims that he's, it's very hard for his uh, his crew to, to, to follow through with. And uh, one of the most influential figures in the industry, no doubt, and he also created the Fable series. 
Next up, we have Eric Chahi, who's a French video game designer. He's best known as the creator of Another World, which was uh, similar to Prince of Persia in the way that they're both cinematic platformers, but Another World was more of a sci-fi uh, setting than a, a medieval Persian setting like Prince of Persia was. And he founded Amazing Studio and created the cult classic Heart of Darkness, which is also another cinematic platform, a very beautiful one at that. And it took six years to make due to its high production values. Also created from also created a game called From Dust. You probably heard about that game. It was very um, went quite under, under the radar, but it was a very good game nonetheless. And it was a game similar to Peter Molyneux's God Games. I mean, it was like uh, a God Game, let's just say. And he hasn't been very active in the industry since. Next up, we have Amy Hennick. She's also American, and she's an influential figure who worked on the acclaimed Legacy of Cain and Uncharted series. One of the most influential women in the gaming industry, believes story is key to a good game. Many disagree, including me, but I wouldn't go as far as to say that story is, you know, the story does not matter at all. Story does matter, but it, story elements and the gameplay elements both have to complement each other in a video game to really make it good. That's what I believe, but she believes that story is everything and it should be completely cinematic. Uh, worked on many Nintendo titles such as uh, many Nintendo titles as an artist and animator such as Desert Strike, one of my favorite games. Joined Visceral Games to work on a Star Wars game before EA shut it down. I think that was uh, when Disney had bought LucasArts or whatever. I think yeah, that was that was how it was back then. Does not consider the games industry to be sexist, unlike others, uh, unlike the more outspoken Anita Sarkeesian, who barely has any connection to games at all, and she's completely clueless, and I'm not the only gamer out there that's that's calling her out for it, but I'm glad that we haven't heard from her in a while. Anita, Anita Sarkeesian, we're glad we haven't heard from you in a while, because things are so much better now. And then we've got David Perry. I like to call this guy the Steve Jobs of video games, and you'll see why. He's an Irish game designer, a unique figure in the games industry known for his enterprising and licensing ventures. Uh, worked on many early titles such as Disney's Aladdin, Cool Spot, and Earthworm Jim. Founded Shiny Entertainment, responsible for games like M MDK, way ahead of its time, and people couldn't figure out how they, how they could cram so much of those brilliant graphics into one game back, back in the day when we had like what, Penny Ones or something? Yeah. And uh, has a certain affinity for licensed games. Created the Matrix MMO called Enter the Matrix, which did not last very long, though it was a little ahead of its time. Was working with Michael Jackson on a game prior to the music's, uh, musician's death. So yeah, he, he recently just admitted that he, he had a project going on with Michael Jackson before his uh, untimely death. So next up we have Warren Spector, another huge figure in the games industry. He's known uh, he's known for his games that feature emergent gameplay. Now, if you guys don't know what emergent gameplay, emergent gameplay is basically a, a design technique in video games in which the designers come up with, for example, if there's two game mechanics, right? And if those two game mechanics were not intended to be, uh, let's just say they weren't intended to be interacted with in the world by the game, Let's just call. Uh, let's just say that it's something that it sort of has to do with meta gaming. If you're if you're familiar with meta gaming, it's like using two game mechanics in a game to come up with a completely different mechanic that the that the creators did not anticipate. It's uh, that's called uh, emergent gameplay. It's very dynamic. The whole uh, game mechanics are very dynamic with each other. I mean, it's really hard to get. Maybe you should dig into it a little more and make sense. And he's best known for the first Deus Ex game which was, in his own words, it, he called it, Deus Ex didn't do anything perfect, but it did everything it, it could. So it was basically, this game was basically a jack of all trades and master of none, and there's a famous meme out there that says that every time you mention this game, someone's going to install it. And there's a lot of games out there that it's true for, so. Uh, and he was a fan of tabletop RPGs and worked at Steve Jackson Games at one point, uh, joined Origin Systems, uh, and produced many critically acclaimed titles such as the Ultima series and System Shock, the first one. Worked on Thief the Dark Project before leaving the company. Warren was invited by John Romero to join his company Ionstorm, where he worked on Deus Ex Invisible War, the sequel to the original Deus Ex, and Thief Deadly Shadows, which was uh, the third part to the Thief series. Joined Disney for a while where he worked on Epic Mickey. Since then, Warren has reunited with his fellow X Looking Glass employees at Other Side Entertainment, where they're working on a new Ultima game and System Shock 3. So, we've got exciting stuff ahead in the future. 
And then we have Ken Silverman, who's also an American. He's best known as the creator of the Build Engine, the Build Engine responsible for many classics such as uh, Heretic and Duke Nukem 3D. He worked at 3D Realms. Uh, primary rival John Carmack. So these two were competing in their 3D shooters. They were like, the, the they were rivals to each other in the 3D shooter genre. Now works for Waxon, uh, Waxon Photonics, Waxon Photonics on their holographic arcade system. So he's gotten into holograms now. Next up, we have Ed Boon, who's also an American game designer, and most of you know him out there as the creator of Mortal Kombat, best known as the creator of the Mortal Kombat series, alongside John Tobias. He worked on pinball games for a while with Williams Entertainment. Holds the Guinness record for the longest serving video game voice actor. So yeah, all those voices that you heard in your uh, Mortal Kombat game, Scorpion, Sub-Zero, get over here, all of that was Ed Boon. The popular MK character Noob Saibot is an anagram of the names Boon and Tobias, the surnames of the two creators. A lot of you MK fans already know this little bit of trivia. Ed Boon is still very active in NetherRealm Studios and he's still churning out Mortal Kombat games and, and, and Justice games and all that, all those fighting games out there. And then we have John Tobias who also worked with uh, Ed Boon on the uh, Mortal Kombat series. He's also an American video game designer. Along with being a game designer, Tobias is also a comic book artist. Tobias worked on the original arcade version of Smash TV and created the storyline for Mortal Kombat and the design of the entire character roster up until MK4 such as Scorpion, Raiden, Sub-Zero, Liu Kang, Goro. So you have John Tobias to thank for all those brilliant characters out there that are so recognizable today and, and, the, and the excellent story of Mortal Kombat. When the Mortal Kombat series saw a decline after MK4, Tobias left Midway. I'm not too sure if, that, if, this, if this point is uh, true. I think it might have something to do with uh, Tobias's uh, disinterest in the in, in the games industry or whatever but i'm not sure but we'll just take it for it is when the mortal kombat series saw a decline after mk4 tobias left midway tobias now works as a consultant in the video game industry and was hired by zynga you know that facebook game making company uh so next up we have clive barker who's an english horror writer not so much a game designer but a horror writer but his contributions uh, his, his contributions to games cannot be omitted he's a prolific horror writer filmmaker visual effects artist and game designer his two most notable games, which is why he's on this list, his two most notable games that he designed are Clive Barker's Undying and Clive Barker's Jericho. Many of his novels have been adapted into movies such as the classic Hell Hellraiser series. I love that series. And next up we have Laurie and Corey Cole, American husband and wife duo. Corey Cole and Laurie, Cole, uh, Laurie Ann Cole are a husband and wife duo who are both game designers. Both of them worked at Sierra Online for a long time. They're best known for their work on the Quest for Glory series, which was a weird game. It was like a hype. It was like an RPG adventure game hybrid, and it worked really well. They left Sierra Online to form Far Productions and Transolar Games. Next up, we have Richard Garriott, who's an English American, best known for his work on the Ultima series, also known as Lord British to the Ultima community. Co-founded Origin Systems, which would release many timeless classics such as the, uh, the Ultima and Wing Commander series and System Shock. The industry darling that is now the defunct Looking Glass Studios would take upon releasing many sequels to Origin's games such as Ultima and the Jane series, Jane's Attack Squadron and all that, but it's like a flying, plane flying simulator, and was also responsible for creating System Shock. David Jeff or Jaffe, I'm not sure, but he's an American game designer, best known for the Twisted Metal, uh, Twisted, uh, Twisted Metal series and the God of War series. Both games were revolutionary and critically acclaimed, as we all know, founded Eat Sleep Play and struck a deal with Sony to create exclusives. He left Eat Sleep Play to work on a new game called Drawn to Death, which had a, had a teaser trailer release or something that I saw, I'm not too, I'm not too sure, and it has yet to be released. Next up we have Mark Laidlaw, who is a writer and an excellent one at that because he wrote for, for the Half-Life series. And he's best known as the, as the writer for the Half-Life series. After the silent cancellation of Half-Life 3, Laidlaw eventually leaked the story to HL3, Half-Life 3, changing all the names of the characters to avoid litigation. So yeah, it had been like over a decade and fans were still waiting for Half-Life 3 until Mark Laidlaw put the, put the final nail in the coffin by uh, releasing the story the rough story to Half-Life 3 and how it would have turned out and changed all the names of the, the characters. For example, Gordon Freeman became Gertmon, Fredmon or something to avoid litigation, of course, uh, uh, from Valve. So yeah, a very, a very sad end to the Half-Life series there. 
So next up we have Sid Meier, who's Canadian-American, best known as the creator of the Civilization series. Together with Bill Steely, they founded Microprose. Meyer is known for simulation games, but in an interview stated that he emphasizes on the fun parts of the simulation and throws out the rest. So all you simulator crazy game developers out there, learn something from this guy. Meyer's name would be put on game boxes to use his star power to help increase sales of the products. The release of Civilization saw the release of different variations of it, such as Sid Meier's Pirates and Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri, which was uh, basically a sci-fi version of Civilization. Next up, we have Shinji Mikami, Japanese. All you Resident Evil fans already know about this guy. He started at Capcom in 1990, created the first Resident Evil and Dino Crisis games, returned to create Resident Evil 4, and uh, which was a big hit, and it was a great transition for the Resident Evil series in the, into uh, into full polygonal 3D environments. Which, but I, I believe, uh, Code Veronica brought the game into the full poly poly polygonal 3D environments. Resident Evil 4 basically evolved the game into a different direction that it felt very natural for it to go. So yeah, he founded Tango GameWorks, responsible for The Evil Within. And his first games include Aladdin and Goof Troop for the SNES. And uh, I must admit, the Aladdin on the on the Genesis was a far superior game than he, than the Aladdin on the on the SNES. But people have their opinions. Anyway, so is disappointed in how the survival horror genre has become more action oriented. But I don't. I think his disappointment has been lifted uh, ever since they released uh, the re most recent Resident Evil. But then again, it's not Resident Evil. It's some first person game now. It's a first person horror. So or a game doesn't feel like Resident Evil to me at least. And then we have Brian Moriarty, uh, who's also an American game designer. He's best known for in in Infocom interactive fiction games such as Beyond Zork, which were text adventures basically. And I I've also played my fair share of text adventures and I used to like them because, you know, it was like reading a book and also playing a game, so it was great for me. And he created the classic Loom adventure game at LucasArts. So yeah, Loom is also a very good adventure game that most people haven't played, even if they've played the Monkey Island stuff, Sam and Max and all that stuff, they still haven't played Loom. I would suggest you go and try that game because it has a very has a very neat mechanic in it. It has to do with musical notes. Uh, you'll know more about it once you play it. So yeah, he worked on Steven Spielberg's The Dig before le leaving LucasArts. Steven Spielberg had this uh, story written that he thought he couldn't make into a movie, so he decided to let LucasArts turn into a game, and Brian Moriarty worked on it. And is a lecturer on game design and also a presenter at GDC, Game Def Con. Yuji Naka, Japanese game designer, pretty famous for stuff that I will just point out right now. Best known as being the head of the Sonic team. Sonic Team was, was this department that was separated from all the other departments in Sega that focused exclusively on Sonic titles, on creating great Sonic titles. And he was the leader of that team. Served as lead programmer on the first Sonic the Hedgehog games on the Genesis. His programming talent can be seen in games such as Fantasy Star for the Master System. Responsible for many Sonic the Hedgehog sequels with the Sonic Team, other notable works include Knights into Dreams for the Sega Saturn, Sonic Adventure, and Fantasy Online for the Dreamcast. Currently employed at Square Enix. Mark Cerny, who's also an American game designer, he kicked off his career with Marble Madness, a really old game, I think it was on the DOS or something. Worked at Sega on many titles, especially Sonic the Hedgehog 2. He worked on Sonic the Hedgehog 2, by the way. And later on, he worked at Naughty Dog on titles such as Crash Bandicoot and the first Uncharted game. Worked on Spire the Dragon and Insomniac games, the same company that would make the Tony Hawk games. Served as lead architect with Sony on the PlayStation 4 and Vita. So yeah, he's the guy responsible for your awesome PS4s out there. Kim Swift, who's also an American video game designer, and she is also a very prominent figure in the industry because she's the one who came up with Portal. Yep, the excellent Valve game called Portal that took the, uh, took the market by storm. She's best known for Portal and Left 4 Dead that she did for Valve. She presented her Portal prototype, which was then called an Arbacular Drop, to Valve where Gabe Newell personally hired her to finish the game because he was so impressed by it. After Valve, she worked on another game similar to Portal called Quantum Conundrum, another Portal-like excellent game. Nothing to do with Portals, has to do with other scientific stuff, but not Portals. So most recently hired by EA to work on Star Wars Battlefront 2. And next up we have Satoshi Tajiri, who's also a Japanese video game designer best known as the creator of the Pro Pokemon franchise. Enough said, but I'll still go on. 
turned his gaming magazine called Game Freak into a game company to create the first Pokemon games. So Pokemon is basically a product of a game magazine. A game magazine turned to a game company that made Pokemon that became the best franchise in the world. The first two Pokemon games, Red and Blue, took six years to make under very harsh circumstances and uh, to the point where Satoshi Tajiri wasn't even taking any salary from his company. He was living off his father's money for six years in order to get these games to kick off. His idea for Pokemon came from his childhood hobby of collecting insects. Involved in many other high-profile projects such as Legend of Zelda and he really likes Shigeru Miyamoto. He thinks he's, he's, a, he's a major inspiration for him. Next up we have Will Wright, who is also an American video game designer, best known as the creator of the highly popular Sim City, which spawned a myriad of other Sim games. He would see great success in the form of the Sim series. His hobbies include creating robots and is a former champion of Robot Wars, that, that show on TV in which people will create their little robots and then have them battle in an arena. His hobby for creating robots would lead him into the field of human robotic, uh, human robot interaction, so he's no longer in the games industry, he's in that field. Next up, we have Will Harvey, uh, Will Harvey, an American game designer. He's mostly a software developer, but he did make one game, which is why I put him on this list, and that game was very uh, ahead of its time. He was a computer developer who dabbled in video games as well. His most notable and also his last video game is called The Immortal, a violent isometric RPG dungeon crawler, and if you guys haven't played that game, do try it. It's an excellent game, very, very unique, very addic addictive, so do try it. Tim Sweeney, American game designer, co-founded Epic Games with Mark Rain. Worked on the Unreal Engine, which would become the most popular engine license for video games. So this guy is the guy who cre created the uh, Unreal Engine that most AAA games out there are just using. Uh, it's, the, it's their first choice that comes to mind when they want to make video games. They're like, hey, how, how about we do it on the Unreal Engine? You know, All those AAA companies out there. Sweeney received the Lifetime Achievement at 2017's uh, Game Developer's Choice Awards, and I'm not surprised. Doug Church, an American game designer, worked on many immersive sims. He was uh, also an immersive sim guy, such as Ultima... When I say sim, I don't mean uh, The Sims or Sim City. I mean immersive simulations. For example, that whole emergent gameplay thing I discussed with you, this is what this guy was on. Worked on many immersive sims such as Ultima Underworld, System Shock, and Thief. According to Warren Spector, Church originally coined the term immersive sim. So these guys were working together at one point in time. He has worked with Crystal Dynamics and Ion Storm, was hired by Wild for a while. When he was hired, people thought that, hey, you know what, maybe he's hired, on, uh, he, he's hired to work on Half-Life 3, but it didn't turn out to be true. Has recently reunited with his former colleagues in Other Side Entertainment to work on System Shock 3. And next up we have Greg LaPiccolo, a prolific sound designer in the games industry with many titles under his belt. Served as project lead on the first Thief game. Served as project lead on the first Guitar Hero game. Served as project lead on the first Rock Band game. So this guy is a leader. And uh, Terry and Eric Brocious, uh, who are American game designers. The husband and wife duo worked on many titles such as Thief and System Shock. And Terry is a designer best known as the voice of the evil AI Shodan and the nature demigod Victoria from System Shock and Thief, respectively. So yeah, she's a very uh, famous voice actress and people are crazy fans of hers because she did the voice for the evil artificial intelligence Shodan that became an iconic villain in the games industry. And uh, Eric Brocious... Uh, uh, served as sound designer in Looking Glass Studios, known for his memorable works in music for System Shock and Thieves. So he made the techno music for System Shock, and he made the he made the ambient music for Thief. Both excellent pieces of music. Eric, Terry, and Greg were in a band called Tribes. No wonder they're so good with their uh, with their musical stuff. They will later go on to found Harmonix, responsible for the Guitar Hero series. So like I said, Looking Glass Studios is my all-time favorite game company of all time, as you can already tell. And a lot of the people in the industry right now that are A players, that are major players in the industry right now, they had their grooming in Looking Glass Studios before that company shut down and these guys dispersed into their uh, respective positions in different companies. And uh, they've been kicking ass ever since, man, because they've got the Looking Glass Studios, uh, thing, uh, they've got the Looking Glass Studios experience on their, on their, on their resumes. So yeah, moving on, Paul Neurath, who's an American video game designer, he's the one who created Looking Glass Studios. 
So this guy is the god of Looking Glass Studios in a way. Founded uh, Blue Sky Productions, later known as Looking Glass Studios. Founded Other Side Entertainment. So he created Looking Glass Studios and most recently created Other Side Entertainment as well to bring all his ex-Looking Glass Studios, all, all his ex-Looking Glass talent back into one place again to start creating amazing stuff because I'm pretty sure he feels like the gaming industry is on, on the wrong track and he wants to bring it back in the, in the right direction. So he founded Other Side Entertainment, re reunited many former Looking Glass employees. His career goes as far back as 1986 and with the computer version of the Steve, J Steve Jackson games called uh, Ogre. So he made a computer version of that uh, Steve Jackson game. Oversaw the production of many classics such as Thief, Terra Nova and Ultima Underworld. Then we have Tim Stelmack, and he's kind of a very underrated uh, game designer. He's an American game designer, one of the earliest employees at Blue Sky Productions Looking Glass Studios. Started off as a playtester, but then ended up working on many classics such as Thief, Terra Nova, and System Shock. Then we have Steve Pearsall, who's also an American uh, writer. Not to be confused with, with Steve Purcell, the creator of Sam Max series. This is Steve Pearsall, not Steve Purcell. So, Steve Pearsall is an American video game designer, worked at Looking Glass Studios on many of their titles, eventually became project lead on the second Thief game, Thief 2 The Middle Age, and Thief Gold, uh, which was like a, a gold version of the game. In case you guys don't know what a gold version is, back in the day when a game would be perfect, finalized in its full form, with all the, uh, all the goodies in it, it would be labeled gold. This game is ready to ship with all the good stuff in it, this game is gold. So Thief Gold was that. And uh, reunited with his former Looking Glass colleagues at Other Side Entertainment to work on Ultima Ascendant and System Shock 3. So a lot of these great Looking Glass talent is back in one place again. And be sure to expect some crazy stuff out there from him. Next up, we have David Jones, who's a Scottish video game designer. He founded DMA Design in 1987. In case you guys don't know where I'm getting at through this, he is the guy who created the Grand Theft Auto series. Yep. He founded DMA design, uh, design in 1987, which later became Rockstar North, created Lemmings and Grand Theft Auto, the first GTA game in the franchise, also worked on Crackdown and the uh, and AP, APB, All Points Bulletin, which was supposed to be this crazy Saints Row meets Grand Theft Auto style online game, which was a slight disappointment to say the least. Worked on a Facebook action RPG game, has, has recently shifted his focus to cloud gaming, so he's no longer working on... The, the mainstream video games per se is looking more towards cloud gaming. Last but not least on our list, we have Lauren Lenning. Lauren Lenning is uh, an American game designer and he's he co-founded Oddworld Inhabitants along with Sherry McKenna. So he is the guy responsible for the Oddworld games. Best known for the Oddworld series such as uh, including Abe's Odyssey, Abe's Exodus, Munch's Odyssey, Stranger's Wrath, and New and Tasty, remake of o Abe's Odyssey on the U Unity engine. Has received numerous accolades and awards for his, contrib uh, for his contribution in the field of game design. So as you can see this guy was responsible for the, Abe, uh, for the Odd Oddworld games and these games are excellent cinematic platformers. Like I said Jordan Mechner was the one who spawned this entire genre and you can see what game, what great games came of it. We've got Abe's Odyssey from Lauren Lanning, we've got, uh, what's that game, Another World by Eric Chahi, so Jordan Mechner. So this is it for me guys, uh, I hope you enjoyed the video, this has been my, a list of my top 51 most favorite video game designers of all time, I had a few more people that I could have added to the list but the video has gotten uh, way too long as it is, so yeah maybe next time I'll, I'll discuss some more video game designers that I missed out on, let me know if I missed out on any of your favorite video game designers because uh, this has been my uh, personal list of people that have influenced me over the years and uh, yeah, I hope you guys learned a thing or two, and I hope you guys are more appreciative of the, of the hard work that goes into video games, uh, and uh, I hope I've inspired some of you to go look up these different game designers and check out their games and uh, check out all the awesome work that they've done over the years, and and I, go, I, 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 hope, I hope you guys have learned a little bit of a, a gaming history as well. I hope I've sparked an interest in you guys to go dig into the history of video games, because I believe that if, if in order to understand something fully, you need to be able to understand its history because without understanding uh, the history of things you can't really you can't really understand them completely so yeah this has been my uh, this has been a list of my uh, 
top 51 most favorite video game designers and I hope you enjoyed it and until next time, bye bye.